He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's sing a song of praise. Hymn number 177, one, two, three, and four. stand in the power of Christ this morning, purchased by his blood. Amen. You may be seated. This time we will continue to worship the Lord through giving, and uh, the plates are still at the side of the, the church here if you would like to do that at this time. We're going to sing this morning hymn number 80, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 during the offertory.
Father, we know that the only reason why we, we can gather here this morning is because the wounds of your son have paid our rent. The, the only reason why we can gather here this morning to worship you, to praise you, to glorify you, to find in you all that we need, to be satisfied in you, is because we were bought with a price. You have purchased us. You have redeemed us in your love through the death of your son, Jesus Christ. And God, we, we recognize this morning that this is not something that we deserve. We do not deserve this great and gracious gift. But God, you chose, you freely chose to give it to us. And for that, O oh God, we are to live lives of thanksgiving towards you. Constant thanksgiving, persistent thanksgiving, tenacious thanksgiving unto you for your glory and for our good. So, Father, I pray that as we open up your word this morning, show us your love. Show us your redemption. Show us. Our great need for a Savior. And may it cause us to glorify you in everything that we say and that we do. Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. I ask these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please remain standing as we turn to Hosea chapter 3. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Hosea chapter 3. I'm going to be reading the whole chapter. It's only five verses. Hosea chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Hear now, for this is God's holy word. And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore. Or belong to another man, so will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. And after the children of Israel, and afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king. And they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. So to kind of let you behind the scenes of what it's like to prepare a sermon, to come to the biblical text, and to ask this most profound text question, what do I do with this? <laughs> Every time I come to a biblical text, every time I come to the text of Scripture, I always come with this desire. I always say, I hope I get this right. I hope I get this right. And I say that with every, uh, every text of Scripture. But there are some texts, there are some texts of the Bible that you come to, and, and these texts are so blatantly gospel-centered. There are some texts of the Bible that you come to, and you open them up, and you go, I have no idea how to get to Jesus from here, all right? It's, it's like me trying to find my way through a grocery store. I have no idea how to get from here to where I got to go. But here in this text, the text is so blatantly gospel-centered that I prayed extra hard this week that God would help me get this right. Because if we get wrong the basics of what we find in Hosea 3, then we essentially get the gospel wrong. 
Hosea 3 gives such a wonderful picture of the gospel that even James Montgomery Boyce, James Montgomery Boyce, who was the uh, one-time pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, one of the largest Presbyterian churches in all the United States, a phenomenal preacher, uh, a fantastic scholar in his own right, and wrote a lot of commentaries, and he said this about Hosea chapter 3 and his commentary on the book of Hosea. He says, The third chapter of Hosea is, in my judgment, the greatest chapter in the Bible because it portrays the greatest story in the Bible, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for his people, in the most concise and poignant form to be found anywhere. And the more I worked on this text, the more I read it over the week, I couldn't agree more with the Reverend Dr. James Montgomery Boyce. That here in Hosea 3, we have such a blatant and clear picture of the work of Christ that we really need to lean into this text. We really need to pay attention to what this text is showing us. Because in a very condensed form, we see the love of God, we see the redemption of God, and we see God's desire to return his people back into him. So if you're taking notes this morning, here's our three points, all right? And I'm taking them directly from the text itself. I'm using three words that, 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 seem, that, that seem to be the organizing words of this text. And number one, love. This morning, we're going to take a look at the love of God. Number two, bought. We're going to take a look at the work of the redemption of God. And number three, return. We're going to see God's tenacious desire to return his people back unto him. Love, bought, and return. Well, let's, let's deal with this love piece. Look at chapter 3, verse 1 again. We read, And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man, and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loved the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. You know, not to be over-sentimental, I mean, if you know me at all, you'll know that I'm not a very sentimental person, but not to be overly sentimental here, there's, there's something about the phrase, I love you. And I love that phrase but, but because many mornings I'll get up and I will get up in the morning in a mood, all right? And you know what I'm talking about because all of you wake up in mornings in a mood occasionally. You get up in the morning, you don't feel like adulting that day. You don't feel like being godly that day. I don't want to live for Jesus today. I want to live for myself. And today is going to be the day where I go around and I tell everyone exactly how I feel about them. Right? You just have one of those days. You get up in a bad mood. And you, you go to the office, you go to your work, and you're just having one of those days, you're biting people's heads off, and you're having fun doing it. You're like, all right, this feels good. I've been holding back for so long, and now I'm going to tell everybody how I feel about them. I come to the church office, my phone is ringing off the hook, I'm getting emails. People are complaining about, you're doing this too much, you're doing this too little, you're not doing anything right, you know what I mean? I need you, pray about, I mean, I'm just people, I'm being pulled in so many different directions, Right? And then in the middle of the day, when I feel like I'm about to explode with anger, I will receive a text from my wife with three little words. I love you. And it's phenomenal. I mean, it does miracles. Getting that message from my wife, I love you, causes the misery to melt away. I feel like a new man. I feel like I can address every email, every phone call uh, with, with, with a new outlook on life. It's, it's, just, it's, it's crazy how that works. Why? Because I am devoted to my wife. I am loyal to my wife. And, and my wife is so utterly precious to me that we have such a relationship that she can speak into my life a word of love and it changes everything totally, completely. I love you. The same thing with my kids. My kids can come up to me and, 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 and come and hug my leg and say, Daddy, I love you. And it changes everything. Some of you know that this past week I took my, my, uh, my six kids and my wife camping in a tent. What could go wrong? Well, quite possibly everything went wrong for us. 
We got there, got, set up, got, got the tent set up and everything. It looked like it was going to rain. I knew it was going to rain, but it was one of those things where, where you think, you convince yourself, well, it won't be as bad as they're making it sound like it will be. Wrong. Ten times worse than they made it sound like it was going to be. Around 9 o'clock that night, it started drizzling a little bit. And, I, and I, love, I love the outdoors. I could just go sit in the woods for hours and listen to the sounds in the woods, and I will love it. I'm in perfect harmony. I'm in perfect peace. It's such a stress reliever for me to just sit there at the base of a tree and listen to birds sing. I love it and listen to the wind blow through the, blow through the leaves. I'll go squirrel hunting, and, and I'll come home. My wife said, did you shoot anything? And I said, I didn't get a shot off. I just enjoyed myself sitting there in the woods. It was fantastic. And so I sat there at that, that night, and it started raining. It's 9 o'clock at night. It started drizzling, and my wife had had enough. She said, I'm going inside. And I said, honey, as long as this campfire stays lit, I'm staying right here. I'm enjoying the sounds. So I stayed there. About 10.30, it decided to rain harder, putting the campfire out completely. I'm drenched, so I get inside the tent, and everything's good. Everybody's asleep. My wife's asleep. Everything is hunky-dory as long as the tent, the tent stays dry. We're going to be good. About 3 o'clock in the morning, my wife wakes me up without being able to talk. <laughs> Pointing at the back part of the tent. And we have a tent that's about 2,000 square feet. Because that's the size of tent that you need with six kids and two adults. It takes four people to set up, all right? So on the back side of the tent is this big, giant window. You know, they, they zip open, right? Big, giant window. And so I roll over and look... And the back of the tent is breathing in and out by itself. And then I hear steps. There's a black bear at the back of my tent in the rain. It's either that or Sasquatch, I don't know. <laughs> Sniffing so hard that the back of the tent is basically like an accordion breathing in and out. I was like, what, what, what's, what's, and she's, I said, well, I'm going to go out and I'm going to check it out. And then, like, like, and, and I felt like I was in a horror movie. No, don't go out there. So I can still carry, all right? I'm a gun owner. I had a gun on me, okay? And so I step out of the door of the tent with my flashlight and my 9mm. And right when I step out of the door of my tent my, with my flashlight and 9mm, I think, what am I going to do with a 9mm with a bear? Who cares? I didn't see anything. There was no bear out there, but there was a bear there, all right? My dog thought so. I thought so. My tent thought so. My wife was definitely convinced there was a bear there. All right? And then, to top it all off, about an hour later, uh, one of my girls, one of my daughters, she, she, she felt like she needed to go to the bathroom. All right? And, and so she ran past me in the tent, and I woke up with her running past me, and I told them, don't go outside without me. I'll take you to the bathroom. I grab her and say, what's wrong? I got to go to the bathroom. Okay. So I reach over, and I unzip the door of the tent. And as I'm unzipping, she leans over and throws up all over my arms. Right there in the tent. Rain, bear, vomit. Why not? Right? It's awesome. And then I kept going and going and going. We get up in the morning. We get up in the morning. I haven't slept. My wife hasn't slept. And of course the kids slept great that night. We get up in the morning. We start making breakfast. No rain. Literally no rain. No drizzle. No warning. We're making the, our, our famous campside French toast. And we're having a wonderful time. Right when I take the last bite, actually not the last, the first bite of French toast, I take the first bite of French toast, the bottom falls out. Boom, rain, down. I look at my wife and I tell her, honey, just get the little ones, get the young ones, throw them inside the car. I'll throw all the luggage, throw the sleeping bags inside the car. You go ahead and go home and I'll break down the tent. I'll break down both tents, both 4,000 square foot tents by myself. She says, okay, you don't have to convince her, right? She's a glamper, not a camper. She jumps in the car, and she goes home. She starts racing home. I take down these two tents by myself, with my three oldest in the truck, looking out going, hey, Dad. I tear everything down. I put it up. We're soaked. I pack everything in. I'm soaked. I try to go to the Welcome Center to get a refund, because we're not going to stay the second night. I go up to the Welcome Center. I walk, into the de I walk up to the desk, and I look at the, look at the girl behind the desk. I said, I need a refund for the second night, because we're not going to stay. And she said, sorry, sir, but we don't give refunds because we can't control the rain. I said, look at me. I'm at the end of myself. Can't you see me? I need a If anyone needs a refund, young lady... It's me. Please just give me a refund. I've had enough. Bears, vomit, rain. I've had it. Snake. We had a snake encounter. I didn't mention. I've had it. 
no refund. I get in the truck, and then there's the last little hellish obstacle that you have to go through before you can get home. And it's called the city of Atlanta. With traffic. Rain, traffic, kids happy, and I'm just gripping the steering wheel going, burr, 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 you know? And I get home. And I'm dragging. It's raining at the house. I got to drag all the camping equipment out of the back of my truck that's soaked. I got to try to dry everything out. And I'm miserable. I go inside, and four of my kids run up to me at once and hug me. And guess what they say? I love you, Dad. Thanks for taking me. And I went, really? Are you serious? And almost immediately, I wasn't miserable anymore. I was like, guys, you're welcome. I love you too. My oldest daughter, my 16-year-old, who does not like the outdoors very much, she came to me. She said, Dad, I love you. Thank you for taking us. Really? And she just melted away. And here where God comes to his people in Hosea chapter 3. And he says, I love you. I love you. Knowing the, knowing the condition that we are in. Remember, God is Hosea, and we are Gomer in this analogy. Knowing the condition that we're in, we are to be amazed utterly that God would say to us, I love you. Those three letter words. If my misery melts away when my wife or when my kids come to me and say I love you, how much more, how much more glorious is it in the stench of my sin and the filth of my righteousness should that melt away when God looks upon me and says, Jason, I love you. The three most important words you hear from God. Amen? I love you. And we find it really hard to believe that God would say that to us when we look at chapter 3, verse 1. Look at chapter 3, verse 1 again. He says to Hosea, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods. And look at that last phrase. What in the world is that? And love cakes of raisins. What does oatmeal cream pies have to do with anything? Essentially, this is what God is saying. God is saying, I love my people, though they look at me and they see what I've done for them. They, they see that I've moved heaven and earth for them. And that, that should be more intimate, more infinitely valuable than anything else in all of life. Though, I, though they look at me and see those things about me, they turn at these other gods and they say, yeah, but these gods have cake. Because that's what was happening in Baal worship. In Baal worship, you gather, you worship that God, and at the end, you got cake. That's what the raising cakes were. And we look at that and go, that sounds so silly. And God is saying, yes, it's crazy. It's crazy to look at God and to say, look what God has done for me. Look who God is. Look what God has done for me to send Jesus. Look how he pronounces and declares his love over me. But yet we go after this other junk because there's cake? It's like saying, you know what, I love Faith Presbyterian Church, and they're really preaching the truth of the gospel. The worship's great, but this church over here has an organ. I'm going over there. That's stupid. And so let that sink in. When God looks upon us and says, I love you. Though you, do, though you go after these, this insane stuff, though you allow these other gods to infiltrate your life and you give your loyalty and devotion over, over, over to those things, I still love you. And then, let's go even further. If we dig really deep into Hosea and Gomer's marital history, we're really amazed at God's love, all right? In fact, we're, we, we get, we're given the marital history of Hosea and Gomer right here. So take your Bibles and turn to Hosea chapter 1. Look at Hosea chapter 1. So let's review the marital history here, right? Usually when I do couples counseling or marriage counseling and people come to me, I ask them several questions. All right, when were you married? How did you guys meet? How long have you been married? What's your marriage like? I go over marriage history, all right? So we can get to the problem. Well, here we have Jose and Gomer's marital history. And when we investigate this marital history, we are shocked that God would love a people like these people. And we're even more shocked to discover that we are these people. So you'll notice in Hosea chapter 1, what do we have? 
God tells Hosea, go and marry a prostitute. Go and marry a promiscuous woman. And so Hosea goes and marries her. He marries her and they have children together. He brings her into her, to his home. He remakes her life. And, and so he sort of like, if, if I could use this phrase, quote unquote, normalizes her. Domestic, she becomes domesticated. It looks like marital bliss. It looks like the nuclear family. The only thing that's kind of weird are the three names of the children uh, the, to, to give off the message of God to God's people. But in, in effect, it looks like it's sort of a nuclear family. Family. That was, so she's coming in, she's going to be a normal wife, and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Except Hosea chapter 2. Look at chapter 2. Look at verse 2 of Hosea chapter 2. Apparently Gomer does not like to be in a marriage relationship with Hosea. Plead with your mother. Plead. For she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. That she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. And you keep reading in chapter 2, you discover this sounds like a woman who has been married to Hosea, but now she has given herself back to, the, to a life of prostitution. In other words, she has left her husband Hosea to go after other lovers. And then when we come to Hosea chapter 3, verse 1, we have this. And the Lord said to me, what, brothers and sisters? Go again. Go again. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Apparently now Gomer has jumped totally back into the life that she had before she met Hosea. She has run away from her husband and she has run into the arms of other Lovers, But notice the phrase, and if you write in your Bibles, underline these two words. Because this is where the beauty of God's love really sinks into our souls. Look what he says here. Go again. In the original Hebrew, this implies continuance of action. In other words, God is not saying to Hosea, Hosea, I know your wife has left you, and you haven't gone to her yet, but go this one time. No. In the original Hebrew, it implies this. Hosea, go again. 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 Keep going. Keep chasing after her. Keep pursuing her. Why? Because if Homer... I mean, if Hosea, sorry, if Hosea is God and Gomer is us, it means that God in his love tenaciously pursues after us. It means that God doesn't give up. His love never ceases. That's why in, in Hebrew it's called hesed, his steadfast love. God in his love for his people never says, that's it, I give up on my love over you. Why doesn't he do that? Because God, being persistent and passionate in his love for dreadful sinners, he's displaying his devotion to his covenant promises. And the beauty of this is it's not like God says, okay, well, I have to go again, I have to go again, I have to go again, because I made a covenant with, 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 with myself, and I made a covenant with you to, to rescue people for myself, and so therefore, here I go, here I go, I'm just going through the motions because I'm keeping my promise. No! This is not dispassionate. This is not cold. God's tenacious, persistent, passionate love for sinners sounds like this. Take your Bibles, look at Hosea chapter 2, verse 14. If you're there, say amen. This is what God does over and over again for those who love oatmeal cream pies over against loving the goodness of God. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. This is what God's I love you sounds like. This is what God's I love you does. He's alluring us. He's bringing us into himself. And he speaks tenderly to us. And he does so through his son, Jesus Christ. God says unto us in the gospel, if you really want to see a display of my love, look what my, look what my son did. Look what, 
Look where my son went. He came to you. He came seeking after you. And notice what God's love does. So that's love. Let's look at bought. What do we mean by bought? Well, notice that God's love is always in action. God's declaration of love for his people is always accompanied by action. God is not a God of word only. In fact, you cannot separate God's word from his action. You can't separate God's action from his word. And notice chapter 3, verse 1 again. And the Lord said to me, what? Go. Go. Seek her out. Go again. Go again. Go again. Go again. And then look at verse 2. So I bought her. I bought her. Now, we just, we just saw the marital history, but we left off one part of the marital history. We saw that Hosea married Gomer. He, he brought her into her house, trying to remake her life, trying to give her a new life, a new start in life. And then, but, but then she's not happy with that. She's not satisfied with that. So she goes after other lovers, and she goes after uh, uh, other things. And, and as she's going after other things, it looks like she's gotten herself into trouble. She's gotten herself into a dire situation. Apparently, she's gone from prostitute to wife, to prostitute, now she is a slave. How did this happen? Well, very likely, in the midst of her prostitution, she actually uh, caused herself to become so great in debt that the, that the only way to get out of that debt was that she had to sell herself. She had to sell herself into slavery in order to pay off some kind of debt that she owed to somebody else. So now prostitution has, has given itself over to utter and complete destitution. She owed a debt that she could not pay. And then look at the latter part of verse 2. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. I've told you before that a lot of times I'll read the Bible and I'll play it out in my mind like a movie. And in that culture, what they would do is that they would, someone who's seeking to, to, to sell themselves into slavery to pay off a debt, they would literally be brought to the slave market. Just like any other slave. They would be brought to a slave market. They would be, they would put, they would be put on a slavery block, and they would stand on that block, and, 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 and then you would bid on that person to buy that person into slavery and cause them to go to work for you. But very often what you would do is that you would strip naked that person in order to see that what, what you are buying. In other words, that's how you kick the tires. When you go buy a car, open the doors, open the hood, kick the tires, test drive. This is what you did when you bought a slave back in that day and time. So it's very likely that, 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 that Gomer stood before her bidders completely stripped naked. And I can imagine her closing her eyes because as if she wasn't already living a shameful life, now she's, begun, she's gone beyond shame. She can't open her eyes. She has her eyes closed. She can't, she can't look at the eyes of those who are bidding on her as if she was a piece of property. And can you imagine the voices? I'll give 10 shekels. I'll give 12 shekels. I'll give 15 shekels. I'll give the dozens of voices that are bidding on her. But there's one voice that stands out to her. There's one voice that causes her to take, to, to make, to, to, to take attention, to, to, to take notice. It's a, it's a familiar voice. And she starts thinking, I know that voice from somewhere. And then one by one, voices die out because bitters start giving up. And there's this one guy that just won't give up. I'll give 20 shekels. I'll give 25 shekels. I'll give 30 shekels and a, and a, and a homer and a, and a lethic of barley. I, I've, I've scraped everything that I have in my house. And I will give everything I have for her. And she opens her eyes. And the person she sees that's talking is her husband. Sitting there with everything that he has in his house. Saying, I know that you are ashamed, and I know that you are laid bare, and I know that you are destitute, but I, honey, I brought everything that I have to buy you back. Brothers and sisters, this is a beautiful display of the gospel. Amen. And the beauty of the gospel is that it's not us on the slavery block. 
It's not us that was stripped bare. It was Christ who was stripped bare, left exposed. And nobody bit on him. They mocked him. They cursed him. They spit on him. They laughed at him. So that we wouldn't have to stand on the slavery block. Amen? That's what redemption is. That's why Paul writes in Galatians 3.13. Christ became a curse for you. You were bought with a price. Why in the world? Now you see the depth of God's love. Why in the world would you go after oatmeal cream pies and a, and, 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 and a mud pit when you have the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and seeing him on the cross, what he did, so that you may rejoice in the Lord and, be, and put to death all other gods? This is what God is saying in Hosea chapter 3. Beautiful words. So I bought her. In love. God seeks to restore the relationship between himself and his wayward people. And it cost him. God didn't go around scraping up all that he had. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you haven't even scratched the surface of what God gives to you in his son Jesus. Amen. Man, God doesn't offer you raisin cakes in Christ. He offers the world. <laughs> you realize that? The Beatitudes? <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit. For they will in what? Inherit the kingdom of God. We're told that one day we will reign with Christ. Why would we want to try to cling to anything else? Oh, look, they're nominating a conservative justice. Now things will change. Are you kidding me? No. Don't put your trust in judges. Don't put your trust in presidents. Don't put your trust in political systems. Put your trust in Christ. Amen. Why? Did that justice die for you? Did that president die for you? Did that political system die for you? Did they go and buy you? Oh, they're trying to buy you, all right. Hello. They're trying to buy you. And you say back, no thank you. I've been bought by a price. And it was Jesus. So we've been bought by Christ. And then, and then thirdly and lastly, return. The goal of God is to return his people back to him. And he does so through repentance. N notice chapter 3, verse, verse 2. Chapter 3, verse 2. We see, so I bought her 15 shekels of silver, a homer, a leaf of barley. And I said to her, verse 3, and I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man, so, I, so will I also be to you. So he's buying her, he's bringing her back into himself so that she may dwell with him for a time. But there's, there's, there's still a disconnect in the relationship. He says, you're not going to go back into that old life. You're not going to have a relationship with another man. But I will also not have an intimate relationship with you. You're going to come back to the house. But something has to change first before the relationship can be mended. And what is that? Look at verse 4. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Now what is God saying here about this? You can come back to the house, but some things have to change first. Well, in verse 4, God says this is what will have to change. Note the first little piece he says. He says, the, the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince. Why without king or prince? Because I don't know if you know the history of Israel, every other king or prince or leader over Israel has gotten them into trouble, has led them away from God. 
And so God is saying, you're going to go into exile. You're, you're going to go into exile underneath another nation. And you're, and you're not going to have a king or a prince over you because all of those men led you astray. Look at the next little piece. Without sacrifice or pillar. In other words, you're not going to be able to practice your religion. You're not going to be able to sacrifice. You're not going to be able to do things. I'm withholding that from you in order to lead you into repentance. And then the pillar word refers back to idolatry. You're not going to be able to sacrifice to me. And you're not going to be able to live out your idolatry. You're not going to be able to follow that religion any longer. And then look at ephod and household gods. If you know anything about scripture, know anything about the law or about the Levitical priesthood, you know that the ephod was a vest that the priest wore when, when, they, would, when they would go and intercede on behalf of God's people to God. But, it, but by the time of Hosea, the ephod became sort of like a, a, a lucky charm. They would, hang it out, they would hang it out in the community on a hanger, and it became a thing that you would walk by and you would touch for good luck. Literally. Like a magical instrument or something. And so God is saying, I'm taking that away from you. I'm taking household gods away from you. In other words, God is saying, I'm going to put you exactly where you want to be. I'm going to put you exactly where you ought to be in order to return to me. What God does, brothers and sisters, is God will take every God away from you. God will take every idol away from you. He will put you at, at a place in your life where you have nowhere else to turn but to cry out to God. And that's exactly where you want to be. I have people come into my office for counseling all the time. In fact, it happened to me very recently. Somebody called me and I went to their house and, and they said, Pastor, I can't, I, I can't sin like this anymore. I've come to the end of myself. You know what I said back to them? He almost fell off his chair. I said, praise God! He's like, what? I'm like, you are exactly where God wants you right now. God brings you to the end of yourself. He takes everything away from you in order for you to cry out to him. Because that's God's goal. Look at the very next verse. Look at verse 5. Afterward, the children of Israel shall what? Return. The children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God. And there is the wonderful answer to the main problem of the human heart. We're seeking after other gods. And God's goal is to come upon us and to put us in a place for us to see his love, for us to see what he's done for us, to take away everything in order for us to see him so that we would seek after him. And then notice the next phrase. I mean, that sounds normal, right? To seek after God. That sounds normal. But why the next phrase? Why David their king? Well, by implication, when God says, For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, he's taking away something that they desire. Because in the human heart, innately in the human heart, is a desire to be ruled over. Now, you may think that you're the king and master of your domain. But I'm telling you, there are things in your life that are actually ruling you. That are telling you what to do. If you don't know it yet, check your pockets for your cell phones. They'll tell you what to do. I can't stand it. I have <laughs> a little soapbox. All right, allow me one soapbox, okay? <laughs> I've turned off all notica notifications on my cell phone. I can't stand it when my cell phone makes makes noises. It's like, pay attention to me. Pay attention to me. Somebody's paying, you gotta notice it. And I'm like, it drives me crazy. Something is ruling over your life you, because you have a desire to be ruled over. And here God is saying, I'm going to give you your desire. And what is that desire? I'm going to give you your king, David. Yeah, but David's dead. There's a problem here, God. David's dead. <laughs> and God says, no, 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 not that king, David. I'm going to give you the King David who the King David pointed to. And when Christ came, that's why he was called the son of David. In fact, the angel told Mary that your son will sit on the throne of his father who? David. In other words, God is saying, I'm going to put you in a position in your life where you will desire me, seek after me, and as you're seeking after me, I'm going to redirect you to my son, Jesus Christ. 
Because in Him is the fullness of the display of my love. In Him is the fullness and display of my redemption, how I bought you. In Him is how you get to me. That's good news, right? You will return to me. You will seek me. And you're going to seek your, your, your King David. And then look at the latter part of verse 5. And they shall come in fear to the Lord. You know what, look, I know I get on this political soapbox every once in a while, and a lot of you don't like it, but I don't care. That's why we have a problem in America right now. There's no fear of the Lord. Nobody's afraid of God anymore. <laughs> That's why you see just the crazy, every time I turn on my TV or turn on my radio, I'm like, what in the world? Can the adults take over, please? There is no fear of God. And here God says, I'm going to return my people to fear me, to revere me, to be in awe of me. And then look at the latter part, to his goodness. Now, isn't that interesting? Compare and contrast with that with the raisin cakes. <laughs> Essentially, idolatry, the problem of idolatry comes down to this one little issue. All right? Cakes of raisins or goodness of God. <laughs> Do I want... Oatmeal cream pies. Why do I keep bringing that up? Because I love them. Do I want oatmeal cream pies? Not the small ones, the big ones, mind you. Do I want that? Or do I want the goodness of God displayed in my sovereign king, David, whose name is Jesus? That's what it comes down to. And God's goal is to dis declare and display his love over us to show us that he has bought us, he has redeemed us from the filth and the mire and the pit in order to return us back into himself so that we can see Jesus, so that we can see the goodness of God. And so when we look at the oatmeal cream pies, we go, I don't want that filth. I want God's goodness, right? That's what the gospel is all about. God's saying to us, in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our filth, in the midst of our righteousness is sinful, as righteousness is, is, is rags condition, saying unto us, I love you, beloved, I bought you, and I'm returning you back into myself. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Let's just take a moment of silence. And the reason why I want to do this is, is to allow the Holy Spirit to just work on your heart and mind. If He's convicted you of some God that you've been worshiping in this life, more than the God who has loved you, who has expressed His love to you in purchasing you through the death of His Son, to return you into himself. If you've been loving something more or equal to that. Then take this moment of silence to pray unto the Lord. Confess your sin to him. And repent. The word repentance means to turn around. Metanoia. To turn around. And seek after the Lord. Come to him in fear. Come to David your king. Come to the goodness of God. Do so now where you are seated.